Hey everyone, and can I welcome you to the 26th meeting of 2020 of Scotland's Social Security Committee. Uh, we've we'll got two apologies this morning. Unfortunately, Alison Johnson, MSP, and Shona Robinson, MSP, can't be with us this morning. And we move to agenda item one: decision to take an, an item in private. The committee is asked to agree that item three: consideration of evidence that we'll hear here this morning, and future briefings on the impact of Brexit on Scottish Social Security are taken in private. I am going to assume there is agreement on that, unless I see something in the chat box saying otherwise. Uh, I know there are some connectivity issues. I am just going to give a little bit of time um, in, in relation to that. I am going to assume that that, that is fine uh, and that, that that is agreed. Uh, I am going to move to agenda item two, but I am going to suspend briefly uh, because I am noting some uh, IT and broadcast issues. So, can we suspend briefly before we move formally on to agenda item two? And we can now move to agenda item, which is COVID-19 and security. This is the committee's final evidence session for inquiry on the role of social security in the recovery from COVID-19, and we'll be hearing from the cabinet secretary for social security and older people, and from Social Security Scotland. Before I introduce Ms. Somerville and invite her to make an opening statement, I would like to take this opportunity to record our thanks 
to the individuals and organisations who have contributed to the committee's inquiry, those who responded to our call for written views, who gave oral evidence, and the people who engaged with us informally and told us about their own direct experiences, either as claimants or as frontline workers. Special thanks are due to the voluntary sector organisations who partnered us to host the community sessions. All have helped the committee and will inform our thinking as we make recommendations in due course. And can I now that said, can I now welcome Gillian Somerville, Cabinet Secretary for Social Security and Older People, David Wallace, Chief Executive of Social Security Scotland, Don Abel, Head of the Scottish Child Payment and Reserve Benefits Unit, and Callum Smith, Reserved and Working Age Benefits Team Leader, Scottish Government. Can I uh, remind everyone to keep questions and answers uh, as succinct as possible, and to leave a couple of seconds uh, before speaking when uh, we go to you, just to enable broadcast to make sure your microphone is, is switched on. Um, and uh, I understand we're going to the, the Cabinet Secretary for a, an initial statement before we, we move to questions. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, um, Convener. Um, I hope the committee can hear me. I believe I've been having some connectivity issues, um, so my my apologies if, if um, the, uh, we lose um, signal at, at some point. <clears throat> During the pandemic, the Scottish Government has introduced an unprecedented level of support, making sure we targeted new assistance to get help to where it was and still is very much needed. We have committed over £500 million worth of investment in social protection to date, and have strengthened local resilience with over £200 million of consequential funding. Social Security has, of course, played its part in this package of measures, albeit within the limitations that we have. And I do not just refer to the fact that we do not have any income replacement benefits devolved and only have powers over 15 per cent of Social Security spending but also that so much of the interaction of our benefits is reliant on access to data from the UK Government if we are using reserved benefits as our eligibility criteria. This limits how quickly we can introduce new benefits, such as the Scottish Child Payment for 6 to 16s, and our options for how we respond to emergency issues during a pandemic. Despite these constraints, the Scottish Government has came up with pragmatic and, I believe, innovative solutions that have enabled us to maintain and expand our responsive use of Social Security. The Scottish Government has orientated its response to the pandemic in relation to the four harms, the damage caused by the virus itself, the broader impact on health and social care services, the economic harm and the societal harm resulting from the restrictions put in place to manage the spread of the virus. There is a broad package of measures being deployed across the Scottish Government to address these harms and to lay the groundwork for a lasting recovery. Social security is just one element of this multifaceted response, albeit, of course, a very vital one. The economic impact, of course, has been immense, from reduced wages to job losses. One impact of the pandemic has been an increased demand for the support available across social security systems. I want to be very clear that I commend the DWP and the many staff working for the DWP on being able to keep up with the demand on their services. For example, when they saw claims to universal credit nearly double during a time of lockdown, when their staff were working from home. And I welcome the initial changes they made, including lowering local housing allowance rates and providing a much-needed uplift to universal credit and working tax credits. However, COVID-19 has also meant many more people, some of course who have never had interaction with the benefits system before, have now needed to rely on Social Security. This has exposed and exacerbated the existing shortcomings in the current UK government welfare system, including the five-week week for payments, the two-child limit, the benefit cap and inadequate housing support. These issues, along with others, are ones that I have raised with the Work and Pensions Secretary on a number of occasions since March. To turn to the actions of the Scottish Government, even with the disruption caused by COVID-19 and the necessary move to home working, everyone that relies on so Scottish Social Security benefits <coughs> have 
continue to be able to apply and be paid by Social Security Scotland. We are now delivering nine benefits, and despite the pandemic, we introduced two entirely new benefits, the child winter heating assistance and the job start payment in the past four months. And our tenth benefit, the game changing Scottish child payment, opened for applications in November. Recognising the extraordinary demands placed upon carers, we also provided eligible carers with an additional coronavirus carers allowance supplement in June, meaning this year that carers will receive up to £690 more than carers in the rest of the UK. We increased the Scottish Welfare Fund by £22 million, enabling local authorities to support those most in need, and a further £20 million has been provided to local authorities to use as a flexible fund to provide to tackle financial insecurity over the winter months and support people unable to afford essentials such as food and fuel. This money can also be used to further top up the Scottish Welfare Fund or discretionary housing payment allocation, which has itself been increased from £11 million to £19 million, in addition to what we provide to mitigate bedroom tax in full. We also introduced the brand new social self-isolation support grant payment in October. Last week, this was expanded to include parents of children who need to isolate. These are just a few examples of the actions we have taken through the pandemic, and much more is outlined in the letter which I sent to committee this week. I am, of course, happy to take questions from the committee. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. We will move to questions now. Keith Brown, MSP. Okay. Thanks, Convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. And can I just say, first of all, thank you to you and to all the staff at Social Security Scotland for the work that's been done during the pandemic. Um, some of the things which you mentioned have been extremely important to my constituents: the £22 million pound for the Welfare Fund, £50 million pound for Local Authority Hardship Fund, plus a £100 million pound package are very important. Um, however, I think one thing that uh, I was going to say the committee is concerned about, and I, won't, I can't speak for the other members of the committee, but certainly the concern I have is the different people we've had giving evidence to us. Obviously, very hard pressed dealing with the COVID situation. I've not always been able to demonstrate that they are learning the lessons. By which I mean, are the things which they're doing differently now, by force of necessity through COVID, that they may keep as permanent changes and improvements in the services that they deliver. And I wonder if either the Cabinet Secretary or David Wallace was, first of all, to give us any reassurance that that has been looked at in a systematic way, and not just through the um, Social Renewal Board, but across the board, uh, and if they have got any examples of um, instances like that. Uh, thank you. I uh, will start, and then perhaps um, uh, David Wallace can come in with some more operational um, issues from the agency. Uh, can I begin by commending all the staff who work for the Social Security Directorate and uh, the agency for the way that they adapted to the situation that we were in? Thankfully, because of uh, the way that the um, agency was established, that um, did allow us to move very quickly. For example, the fact that our operational colleagues already had laptop computers, which allowed a quick movement to home. But Keith Brown is absolutely right that we do need to learn the lessons um, from this aspect, and it is something which, both within government and uh, within the agency, we are already taking a close look at, and will of course continue um, to do so. Some of the changes that we brought in during COVID um, we had already um, a plan to do, such as web chat facilities um, or document uploads, um, but we certainly tried to get them in um, quicker because they were um, of absolute necessity um, during the, the, the COVID um, outbreak and working uh, from home. But those are some of the examples of the way that we have changed and innovated, and we are absolutely looking to see, um, for example, uh, how much more we can make of uh, video um, use as we move forward to um, the development and design of our disability um, consultations, for example, uh, given the much increased use um, of that. So we are le learning lessons for the long term, but I'll perhaps let David uh, speak a little bit more about how the agency has adapted, if that's okay, Convener. Of course. Uh, thank you. Convena and good morning, committee. Uh, so the cabinet secretary has covered a few points I would make on the agency's behalf as well. So I think one of the, the kind of key lessons that I'll reflect on is the, the flexibility, which I think um, 
the, the people within the agency exhibited uh, supported by technology. Some of the things the Cabinet Secretary mentioned have been brought forward, uh, I think, have been good lessons learned. So, web chat in particular uh, proved um, both popular with our clients and uh, from, from our client advisors as well, a sort of easy to use uh, adaptive system which allowed sort of ready contact. So, there's certainly bits that we'll be keeping around about that. The doc document uploader facility, um, many of these things were, were sort of um, very uh, you know, tactical solutions, but what we'll be doing in terms of our lessons learning is building on these with more strategic sort of IT solutions as well. I think the, the kind of key lessons learned and, and the key keep for me uh, is certainly something about flexibility of staff. I mean, as you as you have had from all organisations, the the move of people to work from from home uh, was was significant. We we did that very quickly, as as I've, I've said to this committee before. And I think very effectively keeping our services up and running. And there is certainly something uh, both in terms of an appetite for for our staff to do it, uh, and and something around about the benefits of that flexibility that it brings. To, just um, to to sort of finish off and and to sort of finish where the question was asked in terms of a systematic approach to looking at this. Early in the uh, sort of response to the pandemic, the agency convened um, a, a response group for COVID. We that that has continued to meet and continued to sort of lead some of our responses to this. We we are recently looking at whether we can sort of wind that down and move into business as usual. And as we do that, we will also do our formal lessons learned from this. But but the absolute key I would put is something around about the flexibility of our staff and, and how we, we ensure that maintains for the future. If uh, yeah, thanks, Camilla. I, I, I suppose I'm just not really getting the sense um, that this has been done in a structured and really uh, serious way. Um, now, I know a lot of organisations that we have evidence from will be pretty stretched, but I think with Social Security Scotland, uh, I think we, we. I can't speak for the committee, but I think I'd be really sure to have. Further information in due course that this has been treated in a very serious way. The, the pandemic has been a huge disruptor, obviously, and that often gives an opportunity for changes to be made. So it would be useful to get that. And just an extension to that, to um, ask whether the crisis has developed has given further weight to already existing arguments around issues such as the complexity of the system, adequacy of payments, uh, universal basic income, those kind of things. Especially in the complexity of the system, has the pandemic and the crisis led you to think again about how you might reduce complexity in the system? It is really important, I think, that people take this opportunity to look at improvements for a longer term that we learn from this pandemic. David Wallace, do you want to? David Wallace. Um, if the question is about complexity of, of the the benefits it's probably more of a policy matter than an operational matter i so i, I i'm happy to answer I could just to maybe just clarify do, do we mean the overall uh, interaction of the, the benefit system or yeah well we've seen a lot of examples of systems whether dwp uh, or otherwise which have been if you like streamlined made quicker um, and less need for um, some of the checks and balances, I suppose, is one way of putting it. Is there any sense that Social Security Scotland are looking at that and saying, well, actually, that's a change we could make that would reduce in future the complexity of the system? We don't need to have to do this or that. And more generally, I would be looking for an assurance that we'll get some kind of regular update that this has been the lessons learned part of this has been taken really seriously. Okay, on on the David first Ross. one in terms of the complex. Sorry, uh, there's a slight delay there. Um, so on on the first one, I, I I think we would go back to our design principles in terms of complexity of the system. So every we, we always recognised as we developed this that we, there were going to be two parallel systems of the UK government uh, and Scottish government uh, benefits. Um, we one of our design principles has always been to sort of reduce complexity in, in that system, and we have sort of good um, uh, 
kind of examples from Cares Loud Supplement, for example, uh, and most recently the child winter heating assistance, where we we have always come from a principle of designing out complexity. So child winter heating assistance is again is an example of a benefit where, despite it being delivered by Social Security Scotland with data from DWP, the onus on the client is absolutely minimal uh, in terms of you know they do not have to apply. Uh, you know, apart from some very kind of low number of exceptions, we would not go back out to the client looking for information. So I I take the overall point and I'm happy to come back in terms of uh, that that kind of system. But I think we we have always designed our, our benefits from the basis of, of taking out that complexity. The cabinet secretary might want to reflect slightly further in terms of, of where we are with um, you know the disability benefits. But again, that absolute design principle has always been these should be simple despite uh, the, the the complexity of the system. Cabinet Secretary, do you want to add anything? Uh, thanks. I'll be brief, Convener. I can first of all reassure um, Keith Brown that we're taking this um, very seriously. And one of the, the um, main ways both myself and Aileen Campbell um, have um, worked with officials during this is to make sure that as we going on, we are seeing actually um, what the what the pandemic has showed us that we need to change um, for good. Um, in our ways of working both within government um, and within um, the agency. Um, that is something that has been taken on the Social Renewal Advisory Board. That is the whole purpose of it. But in a more um, a, a short-term fashion, um, as David Wallace has said, as, as the agency moves from a point of looking at how we are actually dealing with the challenges of the pandemic, uh, those staff can then move to then reflecting on the lessons learned. And the lessons learned approach is, is something which we always do both within the agency and the programme. It has been something which has been referred to by Audit Scotland in, in the past and something that we absolutely can concur with, is that we always look to the lessons learned in each point. The key complexity of the system, to be frank, is the, is the fact uh, that we do not um, have a social security system in Scotland. We have part of the social security system in Scotland. And as I said in my opening remarks, that means that there is an inherent complexity that we rely on the DWP um, for data and that we rely on the DWP's uh, system uh, to allow us uh, to function the benefits that we do have. Uh, those systems are, are interlinked, and that obviously has complexities. That is not something that can be changed without a change to the powers that, that we have under Social Security. So there will always be a complexity that we have when we have a reliance on DWP to provide us uh, with the information. Now, we work well with the DWP, but that does inherently, of course, have a complexity in that. And that also means that we have a reliance on the DWP to be able to provide data um, if we request it. And the timescales for that are obviously difficult for them, very understandably, during the pandemic. Okay. Thanks, uh, Cabinet Secretary. We are going to have to move on now, Mr Brown, I am afraid. Uh, Polly McNeill. Yeah, thanks. Good morning. I would like to uh, echo the comments of Keith Brown in terms of uh, we are very grateful for all the work that the DWP and the Scottish um, Social Security Agency are doing in these difficult times. So The theme I am going to pursue is the role of Social Security in recovery from the economic impact of COVID. Um, so I would like to explore um, committees here different policies are needed for the crisis stage compared to the recovery stage of COVID. And how does that apply to Social Security? But I'd like to begin by trying to understand something. I don't know if Callum could maybe help me here in terms of reserve benefits. So I've already had some inquiries from people who maybe take work over the Christmas period who've been out of work. And because of the economic crisis that COVID has brought about, they're worried they won't be in employment after January. Obviously, retail certain sectors have taken a real hammering due to COVID. Um I'd like to understand before I go forward what, whether that person who takes up that employment has to restart the social security benefits all over again, and do they still have the five week wait? Because that would help me understand where I'd like to take the policy in terms of going forward. Because I think this is going to happen a lot. I think it's going to be we know there are going to be a lot of job losses and there's going to be a lot of stop and start until the economy finds its feet. So I wonder if Callum, maybe you might be able to help me here first. 
Callum Smith, I think you're up. Um, Paul, Pauline's wanting some information on that. Can you assist the committee? Yeah, of course. And uh, thank you to all of the committee members, uh, first of all. Um, so there's a degree of complexity with that. Uh, universal credit, which is obviously the uh, the largest uh, reserve benefit that people will be interacting with in that kind of situation is designed as an in-work benefit. Um, so it's designed not just for people who are completely out of work, but are, you know, sort of maybe working uh, part-time hours or have uh, sort of um, uh, qualifying criteria uh, that, that get them uh, access to that. Um, one of the things that uh, people in that situation who maybe are sort of picking up or losing bits of work over Christmas or in the immediate period afterwards, uh, they may encounter some of the issues with the taper rate or the uh, sort of work allowance rate uh, of universal credit, which, which will see uh, potentially quite a uh, fluctuating um, rate of uh, universal credit awards that they're getting over that period. And I think that the, this sort of very much touches um, on the complexity that was brought up in the previous question, I think, that uh, as people kind of move in between these uh, sort of liminal states of work, uh, that there is going to be severe fluctuations in people's income over that period, even with the uh, support afforded to them through reserve benefits. So, so just to, to, so I'm clear about that, Callum, um, someone who takes that full-time employment, for example, would probably use, so the taper would probably come right down. Do they have to start at the beginning of the universal credit process again and wait the five weeks? Potentially. Um, if they exceed the earnings threshold for universal credit, then their claim could be closed. And then when they restarted, they would have to go through the entire application process. Um, but it, it would depend on the... Thank you. Yeah. So this is so that so this is one of the issues going forward. I'd like to explore um, with uh, David Wallace and the cabinet secretary. So I, I, we're trying to talk about simplicity and potential changes we might need in the system. So I use that one as an example of where we might need to well, look at what are the gaps in provision and whether or not other funds that Scotland administers might be helpful here. So I think I'm right now in saying. Anyone who takes up full-time employment who's been on universal credit will lose. Uh, will, will, will have to wait the five weeks again, and all the earnings will be taken into account. And that's going to hit quite a number of people. So I suppose my first question is: Can anything, any of the other discretionary funds, or or maybe should we be looking at a, a new benefit to plug the gap in provision? I mean, I'm thinking here that. Hopefully, the economic recovery will be, you know, short term or medium term. It could be two to three years. I don't know what the forecasts are, but in that time, does does either David Wallace or the cabinet secretary think we may have to look at plugging those gaps by expanding any of the, well, whether it's the welfare fund or even to help people in their housing on discretionary housing payment? Thanks, cabinet secretary. So I think this goes um, really to the heart of um, what we can do within Scotland and um, what inevitably has to be done um, at a UK government um, level. Um, so when it comes to introducing um, new benefits, um, obviously the Scottish Child Payment um, has been introduced from um, the announcement of the policy um, to take in applications within 18 months, and that is absolutely an unprecedented pace. But that unprecedented pace still took 18 months for us to be able to, to deliver that. So the um, idea of putting, you know, whether there's funding aside for it within a, a, a um, contained uh, school block grant, but the, the ability for the Scottish Government to, to work to be able to, to plug those gaps um, is, is not realistic. And therefore, um, that's important to recognise that um, um, the the aspects around this uh, really need to be done at a UK government level because we, we do not have the ability to be able to, to deal with that um, at, a, at a Scottish um, level. Um, and the Scottish Welfare Fund is a very, very important aspect around crisis or emergency, um, but it's not an income top up. It's not there to be um, a consistent um, top up for people who are. Um, who are suffering from poverty. Um, that is why I have written to the UK Government asking them to heed the findings of a recent Work and Pensions Committee report on the five-week wait, for example, including that committee's report a recommendation that advances during the five-week wait are changed to non-repayable new claim grants. 
Um, so that's a, a, a way that, that this can be solved at a UK government level uh, much, much, much quicker uh, than it can be um, here. Um, we do have discretionary housing payments, of course, up here in Scotland, but the way it's been devolved means that you must get universal, universal credit to be able to qualify for that. So again, we have a limitation due to um, how those are devolved, um, which um, could um, which, which will impact on this. Um, we could, of course, look at the Scottish Welfare Fund, but that would require changes to primary legislation, because, as I said earlier, it's there as a crisis um, loan. So it's, it's very important, I think, as we look to this, to absolutely challenge what we can do innovatively, um, but we cannot, within a Scottish context, plug all the gaps of a UK social security system. And I think what this pandemic has shown is that there are some parts of the social security system at UK level that manage to work at speed to make changes and to innovate, um, but there are still some which either need to be either made permanent or still need to be changed uh, because that's where the, the ability to actually um, to supply support for people who are on continuous low incomes um, lies rather than with it being at a Scottish level. That absolutely doesn't mean to say that we'll shirk our responsibilities to attempt to deal with that, but I think we need to be um, realistic about um, the facts of where the, the ability for the Scottish Government lies in this and also where the responsibility um, and power and ability to deal with this lies at a UK government level. Can you, if I could come back to Cabinet Secretary, so I don't disagree with what she's saying and I understand the uh, responsibilities of the UK government in relation to this, but it is technically possible if we wanted to uh, have a short term, I mean, because because as you say, so many of the benefits are in, are are related to those already on universal credit. Yet those who might still be in poverty are still be in work, as we know. But it would still be possible, theoretically, for the Scottish Government to use its powers either um, in a new benefit or create a new fund to um, look at short-term recovery. Um, so that even that five or six weeks where people, because what concerns me is that people might not take up their employment; they might stay unemployed because of this five-week gap, which I do accept is this UK government's responsibility. But theoretically, the Scottish Government. Could, could create a provision for that period, even if it was a two three to three year period, whilst the country gets out of recovery. Well, the, the Scottish government does have the power to um, have um, a, a new benefit to launch a new benefit, which is what we're doing, obviously, with the Scottish child payment. But I go back to the point: even at an unprecedented speed, that's taken eighteen months to be able to um, deliver that in terms of the de designing the policy and designing. Um, the, the system um, for it to get to application. So um, there's the ability to do things in terms of our powers, which are limited, and then there's the, the realistic um, facts that we have about how long it takes to design and, and implement um, a new benefit. So what the what the the, the COVID nineteen has obviously exposed is that there were shortcomings already within the UK welfare system. We will do what we can at the Scottish Government level to, to see what can be done to plug those gaps, but we, we cannot, within the powers that we have and the sheer time it takes to actually introduce a new benefit, be able to be in a position where we can uh, plug all those gaps. Just lastly, no, I, I acknowledge the, the length of time that that would take. I know what you said about the, the, the welfare fund, the primary legislation, but just so I'm clear, theoretically, you could extend that fund and let people apply to that fund um, if they were in that in that sort of five week waiting period for a payment. Could that happen? I mean, if we legislated for that, is it possible? Um, if we went through primary legislation, so if we consulted um, on a, a change such as a, a new fund, um, if we then took it through a primary legislation, which of course the timetable for that would be up to the, the Scottish Parliament. Um, to, to how quickly that could be brought in, um, then, um, of course, that can be done. Um, the fact, then, that we are then relying on uh, the Scottish Government budget to deal with the five-week wait has, um, obviously, enormous budgetary implications for the Scottish Government, and that would have to be taken out of 
um, our block grant, which, as the committee knows, um, is a set sum on any change that we make to Social Security to attempt to plug the gaps in the UK Social Security system, it will mean that that money will have to be taken um, from elsewhere uh, within the Scottish Government um, programme. Thank you very much. And that will Tackle. Sorry, Cabinet Secretary, do you want to finish off there? I think we may have cut across you. Did you have anything else you wanted to say? No, it's okay, Convener. Thank you. Okay. I'm just going to indicate that I'm go- in a moment I'm going to bring Jeremy Balfour in for a brief question because he's indicated something on this theme as well. But can I just follow up on where Deputy Convener's uh, points? Because the Deputy Convener makes an incredibly important point that the issue is what the solution to that is. And the point is, this committee has consistently said the five-week wait is simply wrong, and it should end. The Scottish government has said the five-week five-week wait is wrong, and it should end. But the UK government won't move on that. I think the deputy convener is right to point out that the the nature of the economic recovery could mean that those who are seeking newly seeking employment could be in work for a short time and back out and back in. And a, very significantly fluctuating UC claims and having them ended, uh, as Callum Smith suggested, and experienced multiple five-week waits in, in the months ahead. Uh, has the Scottish Government made further representations to the UK Government? So we, we don't say we don't like it, but we acknowledge that um, they won't end the five-week wait, even though we don't like it. But have we made suggestions to the UK Government? That no claimant should have to endure a five week five week wait, say more than once in a twelve month period or twenty four month period, because I think the situation that Callum Smith was outlining and the deputy convener was outlining was that individual claimants could experience that five week wait on multiple occasions in the months ahead, not just a one five week wait. Have you had any of those discussions with the UK government? Well, the five-week wait is is something which um, numerous um, letters um, have went back and forth on, and of course uh, during the the uh, pandemic as well. Uh, the most um, uh, recent one uh, from memory, as I think I mentioned earlier on, was due to um, the uh, select committee's uh, report into um, the five-week wait and other aspects, um, which specifically gave recommendations on that. And we urged uh, the UK government to look very seriously um, at uh, that uh, report, which, uh, um, uh, from memory, was supported by by all members of of that select committee, um, and to take that on board. And that was obviously to to make that um, advance payment in in a very different way. No, thanks, Cabinet Secretary. I, I absolutely accept that. I mean, our committee has been consistent. The five week wait should just end, uh, but we can't get movement from the UK government. So it's sometimes you're trying to push it a different part of the UK government's conscience and prick that a little bit, and the suggestion that no individual claimant should have to ever experience a five-week wait at all, but if they won't move on that, that they should never have to experience a five-week wait more than once in one year, two years, three years, just to try and get some kind of movement and something that we would like to see end completely. It would also be helpful, I am sure the figures are out there, to identify the amount of money it would cost for every individual claimant in Scotland or the UK who has to wait five weeks, what it would actually cost to pay that universal credit for that five-week period. I think that would be an eye-watering amount of cash, but I think that would be quite an important figure to capture, to understand the money being lost to some of the most vulnerable people that are claiming benefits. So, if the Scottish Government has that figure or can access that figure, I think our committee would, would welcome that. I am not looking for a reply on that just now, Cabinet Secretary, but I think that, that, that would be helpful. Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Commissioner, and good morning. Um, thank you for coming this morning. Um, I, I wonder if I could maybe start with the Cabinet Secretary, and, and maybe David Wallace wants to jump in afterwards. And that is in regard to the use of local authorities compared to a national rollout of policies and benefits. Um, we, we've taken evidence over the last few weeks about how you can end up sometimes with a post code lottery, depending on what local area you, rep- uh, you live in, um, and how quickly and how easy it is get those benefits. Going forward, do you see a greater role for the agency to deliver this across Scotland, or is the policy to remain leaving it with local authorities to administrate it? Um, 
And I'll leave it there. Thank you, Camino. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Convener. Um, it, this is a, a, an important issue which we've looked at very seriously, and it ties back to some of the, the points which I made at the start. So I won't um, uh, rehearse those um, again, but um, we have to look very um, carefully at what we can do um, uh, within a Scottish government level through the agency, um, and what actually um, it would be quicker uh, to do during um, for for local authorities. So obviously the Scottish Welfare Fund um, is is there and is up and running, um, and this obviously was put in place before we had an agency um, to to be able to to um, to do anything like a Scottish Welfare Fund. Now there is um, absolutely an argument for situations like this uh, to be done at a local authority level because it allows local authorities uh, to use their local knowledge, the knowledge of their communities. Um, and to be able to respond to aspects um, in different ways that suit their local needs. Um, and on top of that, we have the issue, as I say, where it, it makes um, sense in terms of timings that a local authority can deliver things um, quicker than, um, uh, than, than the agency would. And again, I go back to the point around data. Uh, which is exceptionally important because when we look to challenge ourselves within government about how we can quickly get money out the door to people, um, which has been something which has been at the top of our priority on this aspect, it's important in, in, in many of these aspects to use methods that are already there because that's the quickest way um, of being able to do that. That's why we did an additional um, carers allowance supplement, for example. Um, that's why we've used the Scottish Welfare Fund to be able to deal with it, because we've been able to use things that are already there. And many of those are at a local authority level. So, in some re um, ways, it was because it makes um, absolute sense in terms of timing. But there's also the additional aspect around local authorities are often the right way to do this because they can respond to local needs. And convener, it would be remiss if, at this point if, if I didn't um, commend the work that local authorities have done to work um, at great pace and under great difficult circumstances themselves to be able to deal with the Scottish Welfare Fund, for example, but to introduce the self-isolation support grant um, and the many other discretionary payments that have came in from, from across government. And, and I think their, their work at great speed um, should, should be absolutely commended on that. Jeremy? Uh, just very briefly, um, I totally agree in fact, with local authorities for all the work we've done along with the agency. Um, uh, just from an agency perspective, if there was a policy change to take something more centrally rather than local authorities, is the agency ready to deal with that and could it um, do that? And how, how many more staff would that require? Um, I'll let David Wallace come into this um, um, as well from an operational perspective. Uh, but again, it goes down to, in many ways, how the agency is developed. The agency does not hold the data uh, for um, people. It's not a data holding um, agency. We require data to be driven through the DWP. And that's one of the challenges. It's not just about what the agency can do, but also um, the pressures within DWP to be able to provide us with data. And again, uh, that's not a criticism of the DWP in the slightest, because they are working under immense pressure uh, during the pandemic as well. But that's another um, um, intricacy that needs to be borne in mind about that. It's not just about the agency, but what our partners can deliver um, as well. But I'll, I'll let David come in on more operational issues. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, so it's a good question. I mean, just a couple of things I would, I would like to say on that. Uh, if, you, if you go back to the sort of the overarching model of the agency, the rationale for creating a national agency was that um, it was the most efficient way to make large-scale, kind of large, uh, you know, relatively high-value payments at, at, at scale. Uh, so that was the rationale for doing it as, on a national basis. We we do of course have a developing local delivery function, um, which is starting to embed across Scotland. But the, the role of that function, um, when it does go live with the way to uh, latter disability benefits, uh, was always about ensuring uh, access to those national entitlements, rather than being an organisation that is currently designed to administer effectively discretionary payments. So the, the agency has 
no discretionary payments at its disposal at the moment. In terms of could we do it, um, clearly at the moment that's not a capacity that we have. Um, the way this programme has always operated, we work really closely with our policy and our programme colleagues from Scottish Government and, and we get ready for for changes to, to systems. Um, and, and that goes for all the benefit launches that we've had and I'm sure we'll come on to it for Scottish Child Payment. So we, we don't create a capacity and then look back about what we're ready to take. We work with our programme colleagues uh, about the, the next functions and benefits that are coming away and gear ourselves up for, for that. And of, and of course, if there was changes to that, we, we would continue to work with our programme colleagues on that basis. But if asked now, do we have that functionality, then the answer would be no, because we simply have not been formed to, to have that uh, capability. Thank you, Joanna. Nothing further. Okay, thank you. Now, I do want to move on to theme three and talk about Scottish Child Payment. There's a question in theme two that I think we have to ask for consistency of approach to, to evidence, because last week with Mims Davis, uh, MP, the UK Government Minister, the committee and her team, and we were asking about um, the, youth, the Scottish Youth Guarantee and the UK Government's um, uh, strategy uh, with Kickstart. And I'm just wondering, uh, in planning for recovery, how the Scottish Government is ensuring not just that its own employability policies are fully integrated with each other, so the Job Start Payment and the Youth Guarantee, but also that they are complementing or working strategically and jointly with uh, UK Government initiatives. I mean, there could be a long answer to that, Cabinet Secretary, but even a brief comment on uh, discussions that you've had or opportunities you've had to do to have that exchange with the UK government and perhaps even follow up in in, in writing would be helpful due, due to time constraints. But is there dialogue? Is there a joint strategic approach taken in relation to this? Well, I'd be happy to follow up in, in, in writing, um, Kimir, because there's quite a, a, a lot I could say on this. Uh, but for, yeah. for the benefit of time, um, I can reassure the committee that, that this is something um, which we're looking at, not just through obviously a social security lens, but also um, through a, a fair work lens, through the work through my colleague um, Jamie Hepburn on, on, on this as, as well. Um, so obviously uh, there is work ongoing at a Scottish government um, level um, through, for example, the Young Persons Guarantee. Um, and we are very much um, looking to make sure that, for example, the job start payment and the young persons guarantee um, are fully in integrated. Uh, but we are, of course, very much looking at um, how we can ensure that those that are using um, the job centre plus um, are also getting information about uh, the job start payment as well, uh, for, for example. But we're happy to, to follow that up in writing um, to, to give um, some more detail to the committee. That would be helpful because the, the committee might want to take a view on how joined up the UK government and Scottish government has been in, in, in delivering for that joint outcome, which is to get young people uh, into long-term sustainable employment as quickly as possible. So that, that would be very helpful. Now, I did say I wanted to go on to, to the Scottish child payment. Um, again, just very briefly, can you give an update on applications for the new Scottish child payment to date before we maybe ask about the relationship between that and the very welcome hundred pounds uh, clothing grant top up that, that was announced recently. What, what what is the most recent information you have on applications for Scottish child payments? Um, I will attempt to find the most um, up to date information in the pack convener. Um, if you bear with me, um, there has been over forty eight thousand applications um, that have been um, received. Um, up to Sunday the 6th um, of December. Um, so uh, that is progressing um, well in terms of the applications. Um, and only yesterday I had a discussion um, with agency colleagues um, about ensuring that we were moving forward with the next phases um, of our um, marketing and publicity campaigns and our work with stakeholders uh, to be able to, to push that up still further with a particular emphasis perhaps um, uh, right at the start of the new year um, when people are obviously um, um, perhaps finding financial difficulties after the Christmas um, period and need that encouragement. Okay. That's helpful. I'm impressed you found that figure. I thought it would be sitting in the brief. I didn't think you have it burned and etched in your memory, Cabinet Secretary, but thank you for putting that on the record. 
I can't speak for the rest of the committee, but I, but I suspect we'll all very much welcome the one hundred pound payment that's going to be made uh, to families who've got children um, uh, who qualify. Uh, I think it's one hundred. I think I said uh, clothing grant. I think it's um, free school meals is the is the qualifying criteria. So I think I got that wrong in my initial comment. Um, what is there? A, is, is there a direct relationship between that very welcome one hundred pounds? To those families and the Scottish Child Payment, where the first payments will be made at the end of February next year. It certainly will. To be to be absolutely um, um, clear on on this, the the hundred pounds winter hardship payment um, announced by the First Minister uh, is not a bridging payment until the Scottish Child Payment is introduced. It's a one-off payment being made to families. With a child in receipt of free school meals, in recognition of the triple challenges that they are facing at the moment in terms of the pandemic, winter pressures, and of course uh, Brexit, it's building on the continuation of that free school meal support over the holiday period, which has also been announced um, as part of the Scottish government's uh, response to, to COVID uh, and to Brexit challenges. Um, so that's um, where we're, we're moving forward with that. Um, £100 um, payment as part of our winter hardship uh, fund um, to deal with the pandemic and with Brexit. Okay. Now, that's helpful. Now, the eligibility criteria will be a bit different. So I, I'm just wondering, are you able to inform the committee maybe how many families who will qualify for a Scottish Child Payment in February next year, but would not qualify necessarily uh, for this £100 grant. Is that a number that the Scottish Government would have? So, although there is uh, some overlap between recipients of that £100 winter hardship payment and the Scottish Child Payment, um, it reaches by and large a different cohort of children and young people. Um, the £100 payment is obviously for those um, with free school meals um, of uh, school age. Um, in addition, the Scottish Child Payment eligibility is wider, um, of course, than that of uh, free school meals um, at this time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm just trying to kind of establish uh, whether or not this £100 grant is a new direction of policy for the Scottish Government, where you have specific funds, you can make those one off payments. You did it obviously with the, the CARES COVID uh, additional grant there. This one hundred pound grant is, is very welcome. Is the Scottish Government actively considering other one off payments to target low income groups, families, children living in poverty, separate and distinct from that free school meals pathway with the one hundred pounds and the Scottish Child Payment. Is this something you are continuing to give active consideration to? Well, in relation to our response to COVID, um, of course, the Scottish Government has put in place a number of measures. Only a small part of them um, really lie within social security. Uh, many other aspects of that um, lie within uh, the wider reaches of, uh, initially, for example, the £350 million uh, community support package uh, that was announced um, near the start of the pandemic, and the £100 million winter support package uh, that was um, announced more recently. So there are aspects within that for Social Security. There are aspects within those packages that uh, deal with different um, ages of, of children and indeed different um, ages um, within society um, as a whole. I hope that uh, helps clarify, Convener. I think so. Go back and look at the, the, the official report, but I just try to get to the fact that if the Scottish Government can identify non-recurring funds, because grants are one-off payments by definition, and they will make a difference that you're, you're prepared to do that. I, I think that that was a yes. I'm just checking that. I suppose. I, I think what we have to bear in mind is that there, there are um, ways where we have um, reacted with speed because of a pandemic and dealt with things. Um, as a response to, to COVID, um, and there are different challenges of, for example, uh, taking it out with um, what the committee is looking at at the moment about a COVID response and seeing what, what could be done at a long, longer term um, way of doing things. And I'll give one example, perhaps, of, of the challenges um, in that convener. Um, 
So, for example, the DWP have advised that financial payments made by local authorities to help meet an immediate short-term need arising out of an exceptional event or circumstances such as um, COVID um, will be disregarded when it comes to other um, benefits that are run by the DWP. That assurance is not provided uh, for longer periods. So, of course, uh, we run the risk of a continued payment being given in one hand and taken away in another. And that's um, something which it does make it different to what you can do during a pandemic when the DWP are working under slightly more flexible rules and what could be done um, in uh, the longer term. Okay. Thank you. I am going to bring in Mark Griffin for a supplementary. Now, Mark, I do not know if you are able to deal with the, the, the additional suggestion in the chat box as well, but I know you have your own supplementary question. Mark Griffin, MSP. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. I, I just wanted to better understand the eligibility for the, the £100 payment to those on free school meals. And perhaps, Kevin, I should declare an interest that I have a child in primary one who qualifies for free school meals because of the universal nature of it. And I just wanted to be reassured that families on significant incomes like MSPs um, will not qualify for the £100 payment while families, some families on universal credit help would be missing out. So I just really wanted to ask about um, the, qualif the qualifying criteria given the universal nature of free school moves to P1 and 3. Um, if it's okay um, to Mr. Griffin, I will get will get back on that. I mean, obviously, the entitlement for free school meals um, in general, people are eligible um, for that if they're in receipt of universal credit when their monthly earned income is not more than six hundred and ten pounds. Um, but on the aspects around what happens within um, the years one and um, three. Um, where there is universal um, provision, um, I can perhaps uh, get back to Mr Griffin um, if I cannot find um, the uh, correct part of my briefing before we finish our questions. That would be helpful. Thanks, Gina, because I am sure the Cabinet Secretary and the Government would not want to be um, handing out £100 to families who do not need it when we could and better target that, but I appreciate that this is a measure that's been brought at, in at, at pace um, to deal with a, a particular issue. Um, I could ask a, another question, Kamina, just um, to ask whether there would be a consideration for a similar payment um, for those children over the age of six um, who won't qualify for the Scottish Child Payment until it's fully rolled out. Whether that's a, a consideration that the, the government are, were thinking about. Then, given this payment has been introduced at, at pace as well, Mark, I'm, so, I'm sorry to cut across. It's a really good question, but it also adds on to the, the, the question that it complements the question in the chat box that, 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 that Rachel Hamilton kindly dropped in, and that's about getting the data from DWP for children over six who would qualify for for Scottish Child Payment. Because Mark's looking at trying to look at a solution or a workaround for that, and we're keen to know about what the progress has been. In having that data sharing arrangement, securing the data to allow the Scottish Government to act in paying the Scottish Child Payment for children over six. Sorry about that, Mark, but I think that just completes the, the questions that the committee members were wanting to ask. Cabinet Secretary. Has um, given me the opportunity um, to look at the further detail on the free school meals, and I can confirm that universal provision. Um, is um, excluded um, on um, the the £100 um, entitlement. So hopefully there's a reassurance um, on that aspect. On the area around whether this um, can uh, be continued as a payment, I would uh, point uh, Mr. Griffin back to the um, the issue that I, I raised. Um, I think it was to yourself, um, convener, around um, that um, we have. A, an agreement with the DWP to ensure that um, provisions made during COVID um, will be disregarded when it comes to other benefits. Um, that is not a long-term assurance, um, and that obviously has major implications for if, for example, it, payments like these um, were to be um, carried out. So I think, again, we have to bear in mind it is not just about what the Scottish Government might want to do, but how um, this is impacted by decisions um, at a UK government level, and of course 
to be clear that um, funding for that um, would be required to come from the Scottish um, Block um, Grant. Um, in terms of providing um, to, to move forward uh, the date for when we want to deliver Scottish child payment um, itself for um, up to 16-year-olds, as I've said to the committee before, this is absolutely reliant on the DWP providing um, the Scottish Government with um, data for this, uh, which is not a simple task because it requires um, an interface um, between uh, the agency and the DWP, and that requires um, to be um, agreed how that interface um, will be built, what that will um, be, be used for, um, and how those two systems will, will interlink. And we are dependent on the DWP to be able to bring forward um, what is required from their perspective to allow us to be able to begin uh, the building of such um, an interface. So we are reliant on the DWP, um, as we are on many things during a, a joint program, uh, program to be able to, to work forward with that. That's something, of course, which the DWP um, are, are well aware of, and I have uh, spoken very recently to um, the DWP. DWP ministers about that point. Okay, thanks, Cabinet Secretary. We're going to have to move on now, Mr. Griffin. I will take you back in later, of course. I can move to Rachel Hamilton, MSP. Uh, thank you, and welcome, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the committee has heard uh, concerns during our evidence uh, sessions regarding the delivery of the Scottish Welfare Fund. And I'm sure this is nothing new to you, Cabinet Secretary, um, looking back at the evidence from um, the 30th of April. I just wondered if the pandemic has uh, raised unresolved issues and red flags uh, to your department regarding the delivery of the Scottish Welfare Fund. Uh, so uh, I absolutely have listened very carefully to um, the feedback from uh, third sector organisations um, on this. Um, the Scottish Government has has always had very close contact, obviously, with local authorities who um, administer this uh, fund. Um, there are a variety of ways where that's done, both through the sharing of good practice um, on a regular basis. Uh, and also through very regular um, contact between um, those times in, in making sure that things are running effectively. Where organisations such as uh, charities or other third sector parties have, have raised concerns about um, specific aspects, um, then we have um, again fed that back um, through our channels with local government um, to ensure um, that we have uh, reiterated their points directly to them. Um, and encouraged movement um, where uh, required. Um, and that's very, very important that we have received information and we are therefore passing that back and, and encouraging um, um, any changes. Uh, there is a, a frustration uh, by uh, some, which I fully recognise, that there are variations, uh, for example, about the way the fund is delivered. Um, now, this is a locally administered fund. It's by local authorities. Um, and um, many other times um, we're criticising government for keeping things too centrally and making things too centralised um, and um, decisions made by the Scottish Government. Um, and then obviously there are some other times where people have concerns that there's too much local discretion um, around um, policies and the Scottish Welfare Fund is one of those areas um, where I completely appreciate uh, that some people um, have concerns um, about variations between local um, authorities. Um, I would um, also probably point out to the committee that we did start an evidence gathering exercise at the beginning of the year to better understand the administration of the fund. Um, obviously, due to the outbreak of COVID, that work had to be um, paused, uh, but we will, of course, very much uh, look to resume that as, as soon as we can practically do so, and, of course, as soon as there is capacity within local authorities to allow them uh, to be able to take part in that as well. And part of that will, will of course, be um, working with local authorities to learn the lessons about the operation of the fund uh, during the pandemic um, in due course. And that's something we're very, very keen uh, that we do. Yeah, and I think, Cabinet Secretary, the committee uh, would welcome uh, the work that you're doing within the uh, analysis and post-pandemic uh, uh, review. But I mean, would you um, say that the statutory guidance should 
uh, possibly be reviewed and the Scottish Welfare Fund um, should now be reviewed because of these uh, nagging problems that have you you know you ha we haven't discussed them but you you are aware of what we have um, seen during the evidence where um, some applications were in local authorities were either suspended or closed um, there was an issue with um, the community care grant for example in April May and June it, the, it almost halved in terms of its applications and so um, there were other examples from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation where um, people had had to go to charities because um, they thought they were eligible, but actually they weren't. And I mean, I think it speaks volumes um, in it, that we must make sure that people who are in these vulnerable situations are not forced to go through an, uh, an appeals process with the local authority, especially uh, during a pandemic. Because I mean, you know, obviously services weren't rolled out as normal as possible, but um, you know, have you done any analysis so far from the chats that you've had in the working group about the problems about delivery? Um, so I did hear um, feedback um, from charities um, a number of months ago when I did one of my um, ministerial catch-ups with organisations around um, community uh, with, with about um, grants being closed or suspended. Um, no authority formally closed for applications um, during this time. That was something which was fed back to us, and we very quickly um, looked at um, and challenged local authorities on. And again, I would encourage any um, organisation that's out there that still feels that that was the case. Um, to get back to us, and we will absolutely look at any um, case that we have because that was something we took exceptionally seriously um, when it was raised uh, with us uh, a number of months ago. Uh, statutory guidance is, is regularly reviewed. Uh, there was um, a very quick check um, of the, the guidance right at the start of um, COVID to see what needed to be relaxed. And one of the obvious um, ones um, we looked at was around. Um, uh, a requirement to um, not have people being refused um, a Scottish Welfare Fund um, application because they had already been um, three times, and that was one of the areas which we dealt with specifically with local authorities. There is um, enormous discretion within the Scottish Welfare Fund and its statutory guidance to allow local authorities to be able to develop. And in our discussions with local authorities, it wasn't felt during the pandemic that changes required to be made to the statutory guidance, but there was an encouragement from Scottish Government to local authorities to absolutely use that discretion, particularly because of the additional funding that we were providing, and use that to, to, to the maximum. On the area um, around um, community care grants, um, those are obviously available um, to people in low income to establish or maintain a home within their communities. I think very understandably during the initial stages of the pandemic, the lockdown measures meant that the opportunities to move home or establish new tenancies were exceptionally restricted. Therefore, I think it was very understandable that there was um, a, a, a great a demand decrease uh, for community care grants during that time. But as lockdown measures have eased, we have seen the applications for community care grants starting to rise. Now, because community care grants um, from memory are six times um, the amount of um, a crisis grant, uh, that, that will obviously have implications for the totality that is being spent on the Scottish um, Welfare Fund. So I think we need to look very carefully at what was being spent on crisis um, grants. And local authorities spent 62 per cent more on crisis grants between April and July, for example, than last year. And then on community care grants, so they are for a different purpose, um, and therefore did see a reduction in demand. Although, as I say, that has uh, changed over the past couple of months. Yeah, and I think that speaks volumes, cabinet secretary, for the discretionary element of that uh, uh, payment. I just wondered, um, you talk there about the extra um, funding from the Scottish government to the Scottish Welfare Fund, but why was only 22 million of that? Of the additional 45 million um, allocated to the Scottish Welfare Fund. So we said right at the start of the pandemic we wanted to be as flexible as possible. So what we looked at was the um, increase to, uh, to to funding that we would provide, 
and that was allocated, the 22 million was allocated right at the start, and the remaining funds um, were, were kept uh, to ensure that we could react to events um, later on um, in the pandemic. Um, and that's the reason why um, they were um, split into two sections. One of the issues which came up during the pandemic was although the Scottish Welfare Fund was obviously um, a very critical way of using money, there were uh, sometimes other methods which local authorities wanted to use um, very flexibly to allow them to deal with um, people with, for example, uh, challenges around um, fuel poverty, uh, so on, or food insecurity. So that was why, for the second tranche, uh, we made that even more flexible for local authorities. So yes, they could use that for the Scottish welfare funds um, if required, uh, but they could also um, use that in different ways. Uh, that could be through DHPs or it could be another method. So what we've attempted to do with the second tranche is to make it even more flexible for local authorities to be able to, to deal with um, whatever um, local challenges they were providing. So it's a matter of um, ensuring that we had maximum um, flexibility for that. And from their point of view, does is is that will that continue um, for them to meet those local challenges, or was that specifically designed um, to be flexible during a pandemic? How long will that um, be? Will they be able to do that? So I think the the, the the increase in budget that we have is specifically um, for dealing with um, the uh, the response to the pandemic, and of course, as we've made clear during the winter support package, also to deal. Um, with um, the challenges that um, low-income families might fight, might face uh, due to, to Brexit. So the, the um, flexibility that's been brought in is to deal with the pandemic. Now, once we move past the, the, the pandemic and the Scottish Welfare Fund is there too. Anything you want to add, Rachel? Well, I think um, the Cabinet Secretary is working in the way uh, that, um, that agreed with local authorities, and that is done through SIMD. I think we lost you there, Cabinet Secretary, just for a brief moment. Um, I've got one uh, last question, which I think <laughs> um, we, I'm not sure if you've covered this, so forgive me because you froze. But um, will because we know that rent holidays are likely to, um, you know. Be, be lifted now. Do you think, and have you done any work on 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 future um, provision for the Scottish Welfare Fund? And I know we've just talked about that extra funding that you put in there. But do you think that it's it's shown that there is a gap there, and that that provision should be made financially? Okay, um, I've no idea how much of my last answer then the committee heard and how much I was talking to myself about. So hopefully um, you got most of, of that during that process. Um, but I'll try again. Um, so there is absolutely um, an area where we need to look at the role of the Scottish Welfare Fund um, and also the role of discretionary housing payments uh, to be able to um, assist people um, during this process. Uh, I would also point out, of course, again, um, um, not. Uh, particularly and specifically around social security, um, around the other aspects of support which the Scottish Government has provided, uh, for example, the Tenant Hardship um, Loan Fund um, as well, uh, to be able to uh, provide um, additional support um, for people with um, housing uh, um, challenges at this, at this time. So hopefully that helps answer that question as well, Kimia. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Rachel. I will move to Tom Arthur. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary, and good morning. Uh, my question is um, into the self-isolation support grant. Just to begin, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary could update the committee on the success rate of applications for the grant. I believe in October. It was about 23 per cent. Is the Cabinet Secretary able to comment on how that picture has developed since then? Push, um, further figures into the um, um, success of the self-isolation support grant um, in uh, January, 
um, and that will be when we're looking to, to publish the, the next set of, of figures. Um, we have looked very carefully, um, of course, um, as the committee would expect, into um, the, the, the low uh, payment rate. Now, some of that um, is perhaps understandable. Um, we see that when any new benefit goes live, that there are um, a lot of applications where um, people, quite frankly, just aren't eligible um, for um, the, the payments. Um, and that's not something which is specific to the self-isolation support grant, but something which we see um, for, for payments in general, which um, the agency has made, for example, in the past. So that the first month um, is, is usually um, quite tricky on, on those as people uh, get used to the eligibility. So when we've discussed with local authorities um, why there were so many field applications, it certainly seems to be that much of that was due to um, speculative applications coming in where people were not eligible, either because the time when they had to self-isolate was before um, they could receive a payment or where um, they were not um, on universal credit and so on. But we were obviously very keen not just to, to, to presume that that was the reason, but to see whether there were other areas where we needed to expand um, on the eligibility. And we worked very carefully um, and closely with local authorities to get um, instant feedback from them. One of the areas which they picked up uh, very quickly um, was around um, the um, area around parents um, who have children who have been asked to self-isolate. Uh, they were not originally um, eligible for that grant, and um, it, they certainly were not eligible um, down um, in, in England either. I am not sure whether they have changed their eligibility um, on that or, or not, um, but that is certainly something um, we heard back from local authorities, and we moved very quickly within a matter of weeks uh, to extend that eligibility. So We are working very hard with local authorities uh, to look at why that has been done um, and to um, encourage um, the people to uh, get back to us with issues like that so we can look at that again. It is something we will keep a very close eye on as we move forward. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And the extended eligibility criteria introduced this week is, is, is very much welcome. Um, one of the issues, well, as I understand it, potentially for um, what seems initially perhaps like a low intake, that one of the reasons perhaps could be that a variation in approach taken by local authorities. I wonder if you have any reflections on that, and you could you could maybe outline what level of discretion, if any, local authorities have, and how they administer the grant. So the um, self isolation support grant is obviously brought in under a uh, Scottish Welfare Fund regulations, and we chose that because it was the quickest way to, to get that up and running. Um, as I've mentioned in a, a previous um, answer, I think to Rachel Hamilton, um, the Scottish Welfare Fund um, regulations give local authorities a discretionary power um, within um, that, and we're very keen um, to ensure that we work with, with local authorities as we develop the guidance um, for the self-isolation support grant um, to ensure that there is uh, a common approach um, across um, local authorities, um, but um, that uh, on the foundation of that common approach, for example, everyone getting £500 and that number not being uh, subject to discretion, that local authorities uh, can have discretion um, around payments as well. Um, and we were obviously particularly keen to um, ensure, um, and this was a point which um, COSLA um, themselves were keen to work with us on, uh, was to uh, make sure that self-isolation support grant um, was available for um, those with no recourse to public funds. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. In, in turning to people who are unsuccessful in an application for a grant, there was a suggestion made at a previous a, a, a session that someone should automatically um, be treated, uh, a, a rejection should be automatically treated as an application for a crisis grant. I wonder if you have any reflections upon that, Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, so it's, it's an interesting uh, reflection on that. I mean, obviously, we need to look at the application processes, and, and they are different. So, the application for a self isolation support grant is designed to gather the specific information about a period of um, an individual's um, self isolation. Um, than how that will affect their ability to work and therefore their income. 
So to keep the process as simple as possible, that we are only um, asking local authorities to gather the information that is required to m allow them to make a decision about a self-isolation support grant and to keep that um, as, as clean as possible. We're not collecting any data or any inf information um, out with that. Now, when we were looking at um, an application process for a crisis grant, there is a different application um, process. So it's it's um, in many ways um, not as simple as that we're gathering um, all the information during the self-isolation support grant process that would allow that just to simply move over um, to um, to be then considered um, for a crisis grant. But obviously, within local um, authorities, um, they are very keen themselves, um, as we are, to ensure that people are getting um, provision um, if they are requiring support. So, within a local authority, we would expect if an individual is not um, eligible for a self-isolation support grant, of course, local authorities are doing all they can uh, to support people in a wider sense. And a part of that is um, due to additional Scottish Government funding, for example, um, around national helplines and so on. Um, but also, obviously, the local authority wants to see if there is anything else that can be done on that. So, the application process might be um, separate necessarily because of the data we're, we're um, collecting, but there is um, a way where we can, through local authorities, provide more holistic um, support uh, to people um, out, out with that one application process. I guess the final question, Cabinet Secretary, um, just regards to how you see the role of the self isolation support grant developing over perhaps the coming say six months and an optimistic time scale if we get to that point where um the, the vast majority of people who are at most risk from the, the virus have been vaccinated. Um one suggestion that's been put forward elsewhere is that with the um, increased use of testing, it may be possible for people to not have to self isolate and be able to be identified as being negative. Um, so this could potentially represent a saving within that pot of money. Do you have any idea would, would that money just be reimbursed to the government effectively as a general saving, or would you look to reinvest it in terms of more targeted support for people requiring support to self isolate? Well, we'll um, very much keep the um the work of the self isolation support grant um under um review. Um, where we, that's the reason why we were managed to move so quickly to change eligibility um, with the, the feedback from local authorities, and we'll, we'll always do that um, as, as part of um, the wider work I do within government um, to head up um, compliance issues. Uh, one of the main ways that we ensure compliance within COVID is to provide support for people during self isolation, and the self isolation support grant. Is an exceptionally important way of doing that, but it's not the only way. And I've spoken uh, briefly about the, the national helpline that we have, and also the proactive calls that local authorities are making uh, to people who are being um, asked to self-isolate, um, and that's being done um, through additional Scottish government funding. And again, I'm very grateful to local authorities for moving so quickly to be able to to um, to provide that that additional um, support. Um, to people who are self isolating. So, absolutely, we will keep these things under review as the virus develops and as our uh, response to, to the virus um, develops um, as, as well. But there is, a, you know, as, as I have stressed on a number of occasions, I think um, aspects which we are doing within social security, but there are all, uh, also other aspects which the wider government is looking at in dealing with financial insecurity in the widest sense. Uh, to ensure that people who perhaps can't get the self isolation support grant maybe aren't eligible even for the Scottish Welfare Fund, but can um, can can get support um, through other funding streams which the Scottish Government has developed in response response to COVID, many of which, as we've discussed, is through local authorities. Thank you very much. Okay. Pauline, would you like to come in for a supplementary on this theme? Uh, yes, thanks, Convener. Just very quickly. Um, it was just to um, respond to the Cabinet Secretary about uh, Tom Arthur's line of questioning around the self isolation grant. I am pretty certain we had evidence early on about this, but staggered me, which is why I remembered the figure that in Glasgow there has been a 53 per cent rejection of applications to the self isolation grant. And here you see to Tom Arthur that the government has under review. 
I mean, uh, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary wouldn't mind having a look at those figures. Because if that's the case, then I think we really need to get to the bottom of why there's been such a high level of rejection, or whether people have misunderstood the grounds on which they can apply, or I think we need to get to the bottom of why so many people have been rejected. Thanks. Well, I, I would absolutely agree with, with Polly McNeill that we do need to, uh, to look at that, but that's exactly what we are doing. Um, and the, I think the evidence of that is shown that within a couple of, of weeks, um, we were um, moving to extend the, the eligibility because one of the areas which local authorities were picking up was around um, those who were parents whose children had been asked to self-isolate and those who would be eligible for universal credit but weren't at that time. And we didn't want to wait for that person to have made their application for universal credit and therefore there to be a delay. So we're looking exceptionally carefully um, at that. As I, as I said, um, it is expected that during an initial phase of, of a grant, uh, there are a number, a large number of speculative applications that just don't meet the criteria for a, a, an award. Um, and I, again, as I've said, that is something which we um, experience in, in other new benefits um, that we have as well. Job Start Payment, for example, the Best Start Grant, um, all experienced that at the start. Uh, but we have looked exceptionally quickly, and, and I would again stress we are continuing to look at that with local authorities uh, to see um, how the situation is developing, as there is a greater understanding in the population about the eligibility um, for a self-isolation support grant, and also the feedback we are getting from local authorities um, about perhaps uh, parts of the population that we need, do need to look at. But, but I hope the evidence is there given the quick response that we took to extend uh, the eligibility, that we are absolutely on top of that and keeping in very, very close contact, and will continue to do so, because it is, as I say, without my compliance hat on within the Scottish Government, exceptionally important that we do everything that we can to support people to self-isolate, because as we look at um, the figures about why people self-isolate and why sometimes they, they do not self-isolate for the full period, it is because uh, they require support. I would point out, however, uh, the level of um, compliance with self-isolation um, um, is um, um, very good within um, Scotland, um, but we are endeavouring to do everything we can to ensure that we can look at the support we are providing and see whether there are any other changes we will make. We will absolutely keep that under review to make sure, because it is critical as we um, move forward with our response to COVID. Well, Neil, did you want to come back on any of that? Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Pauline. Uh, Jeremy Balfour. Good morning again, Cameron Secretary. If I can maybe move on to areas where perhaps the safety net hasn't quite worked, uh, and clearly everybody is going to be at this stage asking for, for more money, particularly those within the third sector. But in evidence we took from the Joseph Rountine Foundation, they were concerned uh, particularly about provisions for disabled people, uh, disabled adults. Now, clearly, you've made a very welcome um, announcement about the winter heating allowance being paid uh, to to children, but that doesn't um, take in adults who are on um, the higher rate um, of care allowance. Um, and I'm just wondering, have you made any thought about making a one-off payment of, say, £100 to those who are on that higher rate? Um, I think that would cost 12 million pounds, according to um, SPICE uh, figures that I have received. Um, and at this time, with a cold winter, with perhaps from having to be at home more than normal, um, would this be a payment that you would look at, and if not, why? And can I refer members to my uh, registered interests? Uh, thanks. But it is um, something we've been very keen to, to do, obviously, during this pandemic, to see what support um, is required um, by disabled people. Again, I would stress that that doesn't necessarily have to be through Social Security. Uh, so there uh, are a number of um, uh, pathways um, where the Scottish Government has um, taken action to uh, support disabled people. Um, part of that has been through our work with. Uh, disabled people's organisations, for example, so that we could understand the impact um, of COVID-19 and work with them. And there has been uh, direct funding um, to DPOs on that. Uh, some of the examples for that um, have been, of course, through the Glasgow Disability um, Alliance, 
um, and also for our work in Connecting Scotland. Uh, I would also point out, um, of course, as well, that um, uh, disabled people will be able to uh, gain support from uh, many measures that the Scottish Government has been put in place, um, which are um, available for uh, also other parts of the population. So, for example, the National Assistance Phone Line, the Local Self-Isolation Advice Service, um, and also um, work that has been done in the Supporting Communities Fund, uh, the Wellbeing Fund, um, and indeed the um, funding for energy costs uh, that have been gone through. The child winter heating assistance um, is there not as um, a one-off payment, of course, but is, is there uh, to ensure that we have um, a, a, a long-term um, support package um, in place uh, to be able to support um, those with disabled uh, children on the um, highest um, care component. Um, and that is something I'm very pleased we've been able to deliver, um, despite um, the restrictions of, of working within uh, COVID. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Mr. Balfour and um, um, other members of the committee um, may think we should um, spend the consequentials we've had from the UK government um, on COVID um, in different ways than we perhaps have. That's something, of course, not. Uh, just that we hear in social security, but also, for example, um, in um, requiring you know demands for more business support or more uh, funding for for different parts. So it is um, a, a balance that we try to strike. But I hope that some of the um, some of the examples I've given um, to Jeremy Balfour um, have demonstrated that we've taken um, that uh, that um, issue very seriously, and we have um, looked to support disabled people. Um, um, that may not be through social security, but the support from the government in the widest sense has has been there. Uh, just briefly, I, mean, I suppose just to go back to the cabinet secretary that particularly those who are um, disabled um, may, may have to be at home a lot more than in normal years, and that's why I was asking as to, uh, the. Um, Joseph Angry was saying that this could be a one off uh, payment because many still will be shielding, they may not get the um vaccine till February, March uh, next year, um, and that will be a period when there will be higher heating costs. So again, it's just to say is that something again you would at least take back and think about again? Well, we have absolutely looked at the aspect around uh, fuel insecurity, for uh, example, during um, the planning of the winter support package between uh, Ms Campbell and myself, one of the areas we were keen to ensure that we had was um, further funding there to um, tackle food insecurity. And there's a further £7 million um, within um, that pot, and the further details of that um, will be um, available in due course. Again, um, I would point out, and I, I don't want to sound like a broken record on this, but it, 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 I think it's a testimony to how how much it has an impact on what we can uh, do within um, the the um, powers and the um, um, and the processes that we have within Scotland uh, just now, um, as uh, the fact that it would actually be um, a, a complex um, undertaking for the Scottish government to deliver any um, additional payments, because we would be entirely dependent on the DWP to be able to provide us um, with uh, data on those aspects. So that, um, having a scheme within Scotland um, would not be, be a, a simple um, a method of us being able to pull off that data from what is held within um, Social Security uh, Scotland. Um, and of course, uh, again, and I fully uh, appreciate um, this. Again, uh, stress is not a criticism of the DWP uh, that they are working themselves under ex exceptional um, pressures and have their own um, workload um, stresses within that. So um, it, it's not um, a, a simple matter um, for us to be able to to do a, a data. Um, pool that would uh, allow that payment to to be undertaken. It is something which um, would be very much dependent on working with the DWP 
And that's one of the reasons why we've looked at other methods that we can support people, uh, for example, round um, the, the provisions within the winter support package, uh, because that is in some, uh, well, in many ways, actually, uh, uh, an easier and a quicker way to, to be able to provide uh, support for people. Okay, thank you, Camina. Nothing further. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on now, um, what for housing cost has being a significant issue uh, during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. I think the figures we have shows that uh, uh, there's been, uh, I, th I think, a 6% increase in applications for discretionary housing payments, but a 12% increase in the spend in, in relation to that. For those who socially rent their property uh, or are in private rent, um, what impact do you think discretionary housing payments is making to tackling uh, rent arrears and indebtedness caused by, by COVID-19, and what more do you think has to be done? One of the, the key issues that we've, we've seen, obviously, as a, a consequence um, of uh, COVID-19 is, is new applications for, for universal credit. Uh, particularly that five-week wait um, that we've spoken about, um, and that does um, create some difficulties. Uh, for example, discretionary housing payments require tenants to be in receipt of universal credit before they're eligible for a discretionary housing um, payment. Uh, there is, unfortunately, as I think I mentioned much earlier on um, in this uh, session, uh, not something uh, something that we can do anything about because that's um, a consequence of the way. That discretionary housing payments have been um, devolved. Uh, that, coupled with the inherent uh, complexity of universal um, credit um, and the lack of information about a tenant's claim, makes it um, uh, challenging for council staffs to be able to administer discretionary housing payments and get help to tenants um, quickly. Um, so that's some of the, the challenges that we have. But we are, of course, working with stakeholders in this area, and we'll work with the DWP to see. What more can be done in terms of, of data sharing? Um, but certainly, discretionary housing payments um, can help, but um, the UC delay has impacted um, on um, the ability to get money out quickly to people um, who are dependent um, um, on that. Um, I would also, perhaps for the sake of completeness, um, convener also point out that the UK government um, has announced uh, the increase to the local housing allowance rates in April um, this year, and they've said that they will be maintained in a cash terms in 2021-22. Um, and this is a in effect um, a return to um, a, a benefits freeze for, for private renters because a, a cash freeze to um, LHA rates is in, in effect a cut in real terms and that will obviously have um, an impact um, on uh, people uh, and their requirement for support um, as well. Okay. Thank you. It would be helpful to know again. You could maybe send the committee the data if you don't have it in your your, your briefing there. But just how many tenants you think have run up arrears because of that five week wait, uh, which is stopped for universal credit, which has stopped them accessing discretionary housing payments. That would be quite helpful information to have. But I'm interested in the relationship between DHPs and the £10 million tenant hardship loan fund. Which has has just commenced. So, would 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 that be for uh, individuals who didn't get sufficient payment from discretionary housing payments, who had to wait for discretionary housing payments, who wouldn't qualify for discretionary housing payments because of other aspects of their income or assets or whatever? So, who, who is the tenant hardship loan fund targeted at? What's the relationship with discretionary housing payments? So the the fund itself will be um, offered um, to uh, loans to tenants both in the private rented sector and the social sectors who are struggling um, to pay their rent because of changes to their finance or indeed um, employment during the pandemic. 
um, and the loans will be um, available from um, early um, December on that. Um, I think what we are um, keen to, to do is ensure that we are able to assist people as much as possible, um, as quickly as we possibly can. Um, I have stated some of the reasons why there are limitations to how uh, DHPs uh, can provide that within themselves, um, but um, I will be happy to, to try and provide the committee with further work um, in writing. Um, I do not have um, the figures to hand about how um, the rent arrears have been run up due to a five-week um, wait, but I can happily uh, provide that to the um, committee if we have that available to us and um, any other information um, around the connection between the Tenant Hardship Loan Fund and DHPs we can perhaps uh, provide in, in writing for completeness. So I suspect the committee should best look at the Tenant Hardship Loan Fund as renters who have are accruing a variety of debts under the hardship, not necessarily specifically because of the rent, but because they have had significant income drop, but the liabilities have not dropped, and they are accruing debts of which rent is just one, one part of their outgoings, but a very essential part of their outgoings. Perhaps we should look at it wider than, than just rent. Would, would, would that be the, the, the best way to look at this? And Will there still be a degree of means testing in, in terms of that? And that sounds a bit, a bit of an oxymoron, because what, what we are talking about, there could still be some significant income coming in, but they might not qualify for discretionary housing payments, but they have got other debts and liabilities there that makes it really difficult and challenging to, to pay their rent. So, can you say a little bit more about the criteria, perhaps, in relation to the loan fund? Sure, Kimber. Um, so, I, I suppose it's it's important to stress when we're looking at the funds that this is for no specific target group. Um, this is to ensure that the loan is available um, for private and social housing tenants. So there are, um, a, 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 you know, many different ways that that can help people. But I mean, in effect, I suppose um, an easy way to maybe summarise it, perhaps, is that the loan offers uh, potential for people to be able to clear arrears and remove that threat of eviction, um, particularly um, if they have um, returned to be able to pay their rent in, in full. Uh, so that might be tenants who have lost their job in the period immediately before the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and um, it's it's really important that that I suppose I stress that there is no specific target group um, for for this um, fund. Um, it's it's keen to to be as as wide as possible. Um, so there are um, a variety of, of um, different illustrative examples um, about um, how that can be provided. The other aspect um, I would stress is we are working very closely um, with a COSLA um, and indeed with wider stakeholders to also see whether there are any gaps between the loan fund and discretionary housing payments to see if anyone is is um, um, falling through a gap that we have in that. So while the loan fund is there to be um, very flexible, there to um, assist people uh, with a pri within the private and social housing um, areas um, and um, as I said um, earlier on to, to help people that are struggling with the rent because of changes to finances and employment um, rather than specifically um, for those on, on low income, we do need to, to make sure we are looking to see whether um, there are any gaps in the provision um, that we are doing. And again, as with many of these aspects, we do that by keeping in very close contact with stakeholders and particularly the local authorities um, for that. And again, the final point I would make is we are also working very closely with people who are applying for loan funds to make sure that they are being signposted to other possible help that is available um, as well, to try and have a, a coherent um, package um, that is available to people as they move forward with um, a loan application. So I hope that gives the committee a flavour of how flexible we are trying to be on that, but I am happy to provide um, further um, work on that, particularly around some of the figures that you asked for, convener, um, if writing, um, if that would assist. Okay, and before we move on to our final theme, I know this is an area where deputy conveners explored a number of times uh, rent pressures uh, across all, all tenure types. Pauline McNeill, do you want to come in and maybe ask some supplementary questions in this area? Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, thanks, Convener. I'll I'll just be brief. Um I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary maybe thinks given that circumstances we're in where both um private and social renters are twice as likely to um uh have lost their jobs than people who are mortgaging, but that's still three percent. So still a significant figure. Um, and of course, lower people are born, born the brunt of that. I wonder if the cabinet secretary thinks it's time to remove the requirement to be on universal credit to qualify for discretionary housing payment, because it seems to me that there will be people who may even need short-term help. I mean, I recognise the Scottish government cannot do everything. I want to say that, but short-term help for renters, I think, is critical for the recovery. And I think we, I personally think, we need to remove. That requirement, because lots of people will not be in universal credit, they're trying to struggle with a low paid job, might just need some short term help with their rent, and we can keep more people in in their tenancies if we could do that. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary agrees that that should be looked at. Thank you very much. Uh, again, per perhaps, thank you, Vina. I'll, I'll um, refer back to one of the answers I gave um, previously. There are limitations to what can be done because of the way that discretionary housing payments has been devolved um, to the Scottish Parliament. The, the requirement for UC is the requirement that was made when this was first devolved to the Scottish Parliament. So, uh, again, um, we are trying to be as innovative as possible on this, but if we come up against a hard stop about what can or can't be done in, in because of the way things have been uh, devolved, um, then that it's not an area um, that the Scottish Government can move on, even um, if, if um, we, we wanted to. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Pauline. It was good to get that on the record. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark Griffin. Thanks, Camina. I Just got some questions about um, benefit take up, and just to ask, you know, more broadly, what Social Security Scotland's experience has been of take up during the pandemic, whether that's fallen, stayed the same, or increased at all. Um, I can perhaps uh, bring in David Wallace, if for nothing else, but to, to, to move it away from me for a while, and David can uh, is much better pleased to talk about the the operational impact that that's been had in terms of take up. I'm happy to to come uh, to give a little bit of detail before that on what we've been doing um, overall to try and encourage take up. Uh, so obviously within the government, we've been very uh, keen to um, ensure that. Um, People are aware of the um, support that's out there. As I've mentioned before, there are a lot of people that are touching the benefit system that have never had to interact with it before. Um, and um, as the committee well knows, it's exceptionally uh, complex. And that's why the, the Scottish Government um, has uh, provided um, um, marketing campaigns to um, encourage people to look at benefit take up, um, something that we've done in conjunction with Citizens Advice. Uh, and the work that we already do with um, Citizens Advice with regards to the Money Talk team, for example, to be able to highlight the fact that support is out there for people um, and to um, highlight how they can get that support to ensure uh, that their income has been maximised. But um, if, with, uh, if it's okay by the convener, I'll pass over to David to give more details on the operational impact that we've seen on benefit take up. Of course, Cabinet Secretary David Wallace. Uh, thank you, convener. So, in terms of, of overall sort of take up and, and encouraging it, um, one of the things that we've been working very hard on is our communications. Uh, so, through through the pandemic, um, we've, for example, ran uh, TV advertisements, uh, radio advertisements. So, so, kind of keen to to try and reach um, a, a kind of wide audience, uh, picking up that point again that uh, cabinet secretary has made that. Um, you know, we we may well be dealing with people who have not had to engage with the benefit systems, whether uh, at UK level or Social Security Scotland previously. So there's been a, a large focus on trying to ensure that we've got those communications um, elements out. Specifically, as a as an agency, um, we've also been been working really closely uh, on our stakeholder engagement. Um, so, uh, if I refer back to the in particular sort of child payment. Um, we recently sort of completed a series of roadshows, um, which, using technology, we've been able to hit uh, 1,600 uh, individuals uh, representing stakeholder organisations, 
and, and using those partners has been a, a kind of key feature of how we try to get um, those benefit take-up messages out. That's pro also providing you know information, um, collateral material for, for them to publicise and, and use. And it's one of those areas, um, just reflecting on some of the earlier discussion around about um, you know what what we might keep through all of this, where actually some of the you know the video technology has probably helped us hit. Uh, a, a wider area of stakeholders than we might otherwise have been able to do. Some of the people, in particular, we again we mentioned earlier on in terms of deploying through this, has been our local delivery teams. Um, so uh, at the start of the pandemic, our local delivery teams were gearing up, uh, you know, to to be ready for child disability pilots, which would have made some of their local services go live. They they have been deployed uh, or redeployed in a number of particular ways. Some helping out sort of the core business. Uh, but really, again, focusing on what those local stakeholders are. So I, I think, um, you know, through through the despite the restrictions and through the restrictions, we have sort of continued to build up really strong stakeholder relationships. And um, I'll maybe pause a, a little bit. I could say in, in terms of what we're seeing in terms of the demand of our services, but I'll pause there briefly if if anyone wants to come back in. Yeah, I mean, I mean, those measures are, are welcome, but. I'd be interested to know what the impact of those measures and the pandemic are. That question again is what's happened to that broad level of, of take up? Has it static? Has it gone down? Has it has it increased through the pandemic? So we, we haven't seen a significant level of uptake, um, which we we tracked quite carefully through the, the universal credit claims. I, and I, and I think at the start of this, we might have expected to see slightly more demand coming through the system. We we haven't seen that significantly rise, um, particularly around about Best Start grants. Um, we we think that is an element uh, around about the, the the nature of the individuals who are going on to universal credit aren't those who would naturally um, qualify for the devolved benefits as a result of that. Where, where we do see demand increasing, uh, and again the committee has looked at it before, is um, where we, we have instigated the system, which cabinet secretary has spoken about before, of inviting people to apply. So, so that uh, quite novel, innovative approach of actually writing out to people and, and saying you you may be eligible for this benefit. When when we do that, and, and as we do that, as as kind of drops, we can see some uptake in, in demand of those. But I wouldn't say COVID-related. We have seen a significant uh, uptake uh, in certainly our best start group of, of benefits. The slight exception to that, again, as we spoke, I think earlier in the, the pandemic phase, uh, was around about funeral support payment. Um, we we had seen a little bit of a spike in funeral support payments. So, for example, um, June of this year was the, the highest month that we, we've seen for funeral support payments, uh, and uh, you know that, that that has dropped off since then. But uh, you know that might not naturally have been the month that we'd expected to, to see a particular spike in there. Um, but but across the board, we probably not have not seen a, a significant increase. And we think that is to do with the nature of the individuals who have been uh, additionally claiming UC. And is there any work planned to try and capture those? I mean, it seems like a fairly significant increase in those applying for um, UC. Is there any work planned to try and capture those new UC claimants to make them aware of um, what they're entitled to from uh, Social Security Scotland and the Scottish Government? We will we'll continue to try and capture them in our benefit uptake strategy, and, 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 and uh, I, I, I don't have in front of me whether we can directly target them if that's if that's the question. But I'm happy to take that one and come back. You think? And finally, convener, um, I just wanted to ask about the impact of um, a lack of face-to-face -face advice, um, naturally because of the, the pandemic, and just to ask that the cabinet. Secretary, really about advice services and how, um, whether they're provided directly or the funded advice services that the government provide, how they are um, reaching people who face digital exclusion um, now that uh, face-to-face advice is, is out of the question, probably for another while anyway. Uh, 
Um, that's probably directed at the cabinet secretary, I think. Uh, in terms, obviously, you know, the face-to-face -face service from uh, Social Security Scotland is not not yet a live service, so you, you, we we are reflecting on what that means for our local delivery. Um, but uh, from from uh, from from our perspective, we 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 didn't never had to stoop down a face-to-face -face service. It wasn't live for us to to kind of backtrack from. Um, one of the things, I, I, again, briefly, Cabinet Secretary might want to come in on, on, on the wider advice service point, um, but we, we are also moving to a place where the, the committee understands we've had experience panels uh, ongoing since really the start of, of this programme. Um, we are building up now into what we are calling client panels, uh, and um, that, that is now, rather than taking people who have had experience of the UK system wanting to, to help us with design, is specifically targeting um, our clients who have had direct experience of using Social Security Scotland services. And what we will do with those panels, uh, one of the first things we are looking at is that local delivery service that the agency will provide and, and where face-to-face -face plays in that. But we, we, we remain committed to providing face-to-face -face for our devolved benefits when, where that is required. Um, but we will be using those client panels to delve into a little bit more depth around about has, has there been behavioural changes about clients' expectations and just how that might operate. Cabinet Secretary, I don't know if there's anything you want, you want to add in relation to that about the advice sector, maybe more generally, and that advice and support now that face to face is challenging to say the least. Uh, uh, absolutely, uh, convener. Uh, this is one of the, the aspects which we um, worked on very uh, quickly um, at the start of the pandemic. For example, by providing um, support um, to organisations um, to allow them to be able to move their services um, online when um, they perhaps weren't um, at the um, didn't have the, the capacity, the ability, or the, the financial um, support to be able to. Uh, do that within uh, their own resources, um, and we were very um, quick to support um, uh, bureaus, for example, uh, citizens and vice bureaus on on those um, aspects. Um, there are some face-to-face -face, um, services which um, are now being um, run, but obviously absolutely within Scottish government guidance um, by organisations, and we're very keen to um, support those organisations um, to to understand. Um, around that, I totally take Mark Griffin's point around the fact that while um, I think we have done exceptionally well uh, to support organisations, and while more importantly they've done exceptionally well to change the entire way that we've been providing the service uh, to do it online, uh, that does not suit everybody by any manner of means, and that's why we're, we're very keen to keep that um, dialogue um, up with organisations. Um, I, I would, perhaps, for the sake of completeness, um, convener also point out. Uh, that there has been um, one aspect where we have um, seen um, a, a great um, deal of, of increase um, in, um, in take up, and that is uh, well, not take up, but, but use of the council tax uh, reduction. Um, that is uh, something which the Scottish uh, government um, does um, uh, support, obviously, local authorities um, with. And we have seen um, the caseload for council tax reduction um, increasing by over 30,000, um, and that is something which um, we are providing additional support for for councils on um, when it comes to, to council tax um, reduction. But in, in other aspects, um, for the um, benefits that are deployed by Social Security Scotland, as David Wallace has said, when we look at, for example, the age profile um, of the people on universal credit, is perhaps. Uh, not surprising um, that the um, uptake in Best Start grant, for example, um, has uh, has not increased, but um, the, the certainly the um, implications for um, council tax uh, reduction caseload um, has um, has been um, quite um, dramatic during this time. Okay, thank you, Cabinet Secretary uh, Rachel Hamilton. Uh, thank you. It was just a point of clarification, really, uh, over Mark's question about the uptake in universal credit, which now we're seeing around about 470,000 people, I think, in Scotland claiming universal credit. But uh, David Wallace said that he thinks that uh, the, the universal credit um, claimants, some of them, are now uh, new 
claimants and uh, I presume the profiling that you've done on that, you believe that those individuals are more likely to get back into work. Um, so perhaps they don't have a um, they don't have a need to go out looking for um, extra benefits. But I think that obviously with the with the, the the number of workless households that will increase, is it possible that your benefits uptake strategy should include um, more of a a deep dive into the individual circumstances of these people? So that you know you can really identify um, those people who are uh, missing out and will continue to miss out um, if they if they don't uh, get to the right uh, benefits. So what, one of the aspects, um, perhaps around um, David's comments, which I'll, I'll um, expand upon, um, is is around the fact, as I said, it's around the, the age of the people who are applying would suggest that that's one of the reasons that they are not applying for Best Start Grant. So they would not be the the, the age um, where you would um, think that a person would have um, a, a new child. So some of it around just the sheer demographics um, of the type of people um, who are applying. For, for for universal credit for the first time and whether that would make them um, someone who would um, be eligible or, or indeed um, have a, a child to make them um, eligible. The aspect around um, who is claiming now um, is something which we're, we're very keen to, to work on. Um, that's one of the reasons why we're continuing um, to look at what more can be done around benefit take-up. So, for example, part of the winter support package um, that was recently announced is a post-Christmas benefit take-up campaign. Um, that won't just look at the devolved um, issues, but also the wider entitlements um, that people have and an encouragement to um, support that. Um, I have, um, with my uh, counterparts in Wales and Northern Ireland, also written to the UK government, um, and we jointly encourage them um, to, to do um, their a part in encouraging um, benefit take up uh, too, because we recognise that we can achieve more if we work together um, on this. And when it comes to specific um, groups in society uh, that might be maybe uh, not um, the, the type of people who might have knowledge of the system um, at present, we are very keen to see what more we can do around that. But I, I would suggest that we, we do that as part of our normal business as usual work to ensure that we're reaching people um, who um, are seldom heard in, in um, these um, situations. And we do particular target work, for example, um, around ensuring that people um, in um, ethnic minority communities and others um, have an awareness of the types of work that we're doing and also um, that what we're doing is culturally appropriate for, for different parts of um, our society to encourage benefit take up in its widest sense. So I, I hope that gives Rachel Hamilton an assurance that we are not just doing a blanket approach, but we do look very carefully as a matter of course about what we can do uh, to target whether it's specific age groups or specific parts of the community. Rachel? Thank you. Thank you, Convener. That's it. Okay, thank you. I, I think uh, members have had a fair, uh, extensive opportunity to question the Cabinet Secretary um, David Wallace and, and and officials today. That's two hours, Cabinet Secretary. Can, can I thank you for uh, the time and commitment you've shown to assist us with the inquiry? So uh, we're going to move to the next agenda item, but just put on my record formally on behalf of myself and 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 and, and the rest of the committee. My thanks to. Jill Ann Somerville, David Wallace, Don Abel and Carla Smith for your attendance and assistance with the inquiry. Thank you very much. And we now move to our next agenda item, which is agenda item three, which we previously agreed to take in private and a different platform. So we'll now close this part of the meeting. Thank you.